I suppose the correct opening greeting for today is to say happy birthday. This is, as you know, the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Computer Conservation Society. And uh, I brought along um, a copy of issue number one of Resurrection. Uh, many of you, or well, all of you probably, who are members of CCS, will uh, receive our quarterly journal. And our first editor um, wrote, and i just briefly like to quote from it, the CCS is the brainchild of Doran Swade, curator of computing at the Science Museum. And it's Doran who is here today as well, and will again be known to many of you. Um, Doran was uh, the, uh, it was his brainchild. And uh, it was Doran who came along to the BCS in 1989 and asked whether the BCS would consider uh, having a special interest group uh, on the history of computing. And the two people that he came to in the BCS, one was the uh, late and much lamented Tony Sale, who at that time was the staff member, uh, the head of the technical division um, at the BC, uh, at BCS headquarters, and uh, the vice president responsible for specialist groups at that time uh, was me. And Tony uh, came to me and said, there is this bloke from the Science Museum who's got this very good idea. Well, I, I knew enough by then that if Tony had said something was a good idea, the last thing any vice president uh, ought to do was to say no. So we welcomed the CCS, uh, and I actually chaired the board meeting where we approved the Computer Conservation Society as a specialist group. So it's a, it, a, it, it's a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, many of you will remember you were Willie, who uh, was a BCS past president. He was, I think in those days, he was DP manager. I don't think he was sort of IT director. He was DP manager of the Prudential in High Hoban, and he became our first chairman and led us through those early days, and Doran, uh, Tony Sale and I, together with Sandy Douglas, um, according to Resurrection, because I've long since forgotten, um, <laughs> formed the first committee uh, and set about creating a proper committee uh, of covering a whole range of activities. Because one of the things that Doran emphasized from the beginning was a key part of the CCS was to uh, restore to working order and then to demonstrate uh, for the coming generations uh, uh, computer hardware and software and that remains at the heart of what the uh, Conservation Society does. I, it would be remiss of me not to uh, just also uh, remark that at the back of uh, issue number one there is a full list and it runs, cuts a whole page, it's about 15, 16 names, of, uh, of the first full committee that we created. And I'm happy, in, in a way, and also I think I have to say surprised, that four of the people who are listed on that page, uh, 30 years later, are still on the committee. Now, <laughs> many of you may say they should have long since moved over, but let some of the younger have a go. Well, um, 12 of the 16 are probably younger, um, and are having a go. But uh, I, I think I should pay tribute to uh, Doran uh, who, and uh, Dan Hayton, who uh, has done various roles. He was treasurer for quite a long while, and is today behind the video camera, which uh, we record every meeting that we hold. So there is a record for uh, the historic archives. Um, there is a record of each meeting uh, that we've held, and in recent years, those are on the web, so uh, if when you get home you can't remember what it was that happened this afternoon, uh, you'll have to wait a couple of days, but it will then, uh, in a week or two, be uh, on the internet. And uh, Doc's so own that committee, those four people who've been there for the 30 years, Doran, Dan Hayton, myself, and finally, 
Martin Campbell Kelly, uh, who from the, then from the University of Warwick, now happily retired, well, happily retired, but still linked to the University of Warwick. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Martin today, uh, because it was Martin who gave the first uh, presentation to the CCS, uh, well, we founded the committee in 1989. Early in 1990, uh, you gave uh, the first talk to the CCS, uh, and it was uh, entitled ICL and the British Computer Industry. And it therefore seemed appropriate that 30 years on, that we should invite Martin to review uh, the changes uh, and, in a way, the demise, sadly, of uh, ICL uh, since then, but also the way in which other, uh, the, the research has gone on and our understanding of uh, the British IT industry um, has developed. So, Martin, can I at that point hand over to you? And uh, Martin, I, do you want to take questions? Oh, probably at the end. At the end. Okay. okay. There, there will be a question, an opportunity for questions at the end, and we have a microphone so that we can record it uh, for posterity. So, Martin, are you? You're all wired up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Off your mind. Can you hear me? Yeah. ICL Revisited. I wrote the book uh, between 1985 and 1989. It was published very early uh, in 1990. Um, but of course, I've never actually read it. Uh, <laughs> I, I read the proofs, uh, but I've never read it since, um, except, you know, occasionally to, to uh, do some fact checking. So that's what I spent the summer doing, was rereading my book as if, as if I'd come to it fresh. And frankly, it, I was amazed how much I'd forgotten. So it was, it was an experience. Um, the other thing I did was to um, review the interviews that I conducted, about 30 interviews I conducted with people um, when I was writing the book. So I'd sort of been looking at the notes I made on some of those meetings as well. Um, and. Um, I could say slightly more, but not much more than, than I said at the time. The book was actually quite frank, um, uh, but, but I, I can say a bit more than I would have done at the time. So um, I picked out, kind of as a reader, five things in, in the book that I, th I thought would be interesting today. So there was the relationship with IBM, um, BTM and the secret war at, at Bletchley Park. Um, the transition from punch card machines to computers, and the politics and economics of the new range. So it's not the technology, but, but really the political environment. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, to ask whether ICL could have survived or not. Um, but let me start first by saying a little bit about how the book came to be written. The person I really have to thank most of all is David Marwood, who is the company secretary. He is the second person from the right in the white suit in that photograph. Um, he was close to retirement at that time, uh, and he had a deep interest in the history of ICL. In fact, I've written the article on the right, um, which was the recovery from ICL's most recent crisis. Um, I'll show that photograph at the end because it, it, you recognise some of the people there. They come up towards the end of the story. Um, <clears throat> how it came about was that in 1984, early 1984, um, David Marwood had uh, set in motion an idea to create a national archive or a, a national museum of computing. Um, the outcome of that was the National Archive for the History of Computing at Manchester University, well, that was established, I think, in uh, about 86. Um, so he called us to a, a meeting of people who had expressed an interest, which I see was in September 1984, where we all met and had a buffet lunch at, um, at uh, ICL Putney. Um, I got talking to, um, uh, to David Marwood and said, you know, what, do you, what, what do you have? Uh, as a company, said, well, come and have a look. So I, I, a couple of weeks later, I did go down and have a look at the archive. 
I tell this story, and it was really quite exciting. It was a, a room probably a quarter of the size of this, but absolutely packed uh, with, with um, documents. Um, and I made the proposal that I would write a business history of ICL, and he said, um, right, yes. Um, I should mention some of the people who also helped me. First and foremost was Gordon Bates. I, I don't have a photograph of him. Um, but he was David's successor as company secretary. Um, on the left, Arthur Humphreys also had a, a deep interest in computer history. In fact, he's a, a director or was a director of the Charles Babbage Institute, which was the American principal archive for computer history. Jack Howlett's another person very interested in history. I will come to and say more of later. And the person on the right, some will know, was Bernard Bellring at Bertie was always called. And he had created the ICL Technical Archive, which was different to the corporate archive in Putney. It was in a warehouse in Letchworth. And uh, that was, he was succeeded by Gordon Collins. And, uh, um, he was enormously helpful. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to thank him, even though he's, he's no longer alive. Um, for example, he, he took my research students at the time, uh, Mary Crook, and for a summer, had to index the entire archive, which was enormously helpful to me later. Um, <clears throat> I just, at that time, had rec fairly recently completed a PhD on the history of computer programming in Britain. Um, I knew absolutely nothing about business history, so it was quite a bold undertaking on me. Um, I didn't even know how to read a, a, a balance sheet. I didn't know what a company secretary was, but I certainly know now. Um, and uh, I discovered that actually it's quite a mature field. Um, so there's two principal magazine uh, journals, academic journals, Business History Review and Business History, both of which started in the 1950s. So compared to history of computing and the annals of history of computing starting in 1979, so it was a five-year-old field when I was at this time, business history was 25, 30 years old, so it's actually quite a mature field. Um, um, I came into contact with a man called Al Chandler. He was what the Americans called a senior scholar, a phrase we don't use over here. We would probably call him the doyen of, of business historians. He was a professor at Harvard University. Um, and we got to know one another. And he was very interested in the fact that I was writing history uh, of, of computing because um, he wanted to write a book uh, on the history of computers and electronics. And in fact, it came out many years later. It's called The Electronic Century. Um, <clears throat> now, um, there is a danger with doing corporate business histories that the thing gets squashed by the lawyers in the firm. Um, and this was something people warned, warned me about quite early on. Um, there was a story going around in the time that um, somebody had, had written uh, business history that had taken them five years uh, of an American insurance company. Uh, and the, the lawyers inside the company decided they, they, did, they, they saw no value in this being and only danger in publishing such a thing. And so ICL was quite brave actually in, in doing this, but I had a contract that they could always squash the whole thing at any time. Um, when I discussed this with Jack Howlett, he was then the university relations person with ICL and also editor of the ICL Technical Journal. So we cooked up a rooms where I, I would write the book in four installments. Um, and after each installment was given to the company secretary to review with his colleagues, um, we would publish anything that was likely to be controversial, sorry, controversial in the ICL Technical Journal. So there's three articles. Um, they're online now, actually, thanks to Alan Thompson, <laughs> who's, who's managed to get Fujitsu to put them online. Um, just put the title in Google and it'll find it for you. Um, <clears throat> and the problem of doing business history, which I see as being the biography of a company, oh, there's Alan, um, that it's quite difficult to who to include and who to leave out. Um, this was an art, uh, a diagram that was drawn by Bertie Bellringer, and it, uh, it shows the origins of 
um, ICT in this diagram, uh, going back to, to IBM uh, and Power Samus, one was one of the companies, goes back to Remington Rand and Powers in the United States. So it's kind of a, for me, the spine of this story, really, the principal character was going to be BTM uh, and carrying forward into ICT and ICL. Um, some people criticise the book that, for example, I didn't say very much about the uh, computers, which um, it's the thing about biography, you can only, <laughs> you have to bring in some of the relatives, but not all of them, and, 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 and <laughs> very, very degrees of death. <clears throat> This was the other diagram that uh, Bernard Bellring had produced, um, which shows the evening. And I do say a little bit about it in the book about those uh, companies that eventually get folded into ICL. Well, let me talk on first then my first theme, <coughs> which was the relationship with IBM. BTM started as a firm called the Tabulator Limited in 1904. Um, it was founded by uh, Raleigh Philpotts, who's in the middle here, um, and Robert Porter. Robert Porter was British, but he had been director of the US Census. When they, the current president then, at that time, was assassinated, um, he came back to England as he lost his political position um, and was looking for an office, stumbled across um, um, uh, offices uh, not far from the Strand, where, where he where the British Westinghouse was located. And Rolly Philpotts was the se company secretary of uh, British Westinghouse, and they cooked up the idea of importing these census machines that, that Holworth, Herman Holworth had produced in the United States and marketing them in England. So um, that was then the uh, tabulating machine company in the United States. And the third person on the right uh, is um, Everard Green just C.A. Everard Green, um, uh, who was a, a graduate engineer and he was sort of responsible for the technical side of what was a punch card business at the time. <clears throat> that was, that's the machine that, uh, that they used. It's called the Pinbox Tabulator and it's a, a sort of a descendant of the original census machine. Photographed on the right uh, is the first installation or one of the first installations in the UK. It's at the London, it's like the LNYR, is at Lancashire and North York's Railway. Um, you can see at the back the integrating tabulators at the back and on the front of the table you can see some of the early car punches. Um, TMC, the, the American firm, Tabulator Machine Company, uh, around 1907 they produced a series of automatic machines where it were a great advancement on the early tabulators. We don't have a copy of the original tabulator agreement of the tabulator limited. Um, but anyway, they felt the need to draw up a new agreement with Holworth. Um, and that was drawn up in 1907. And the British company was called, initially it was called BTMC. So it was TMC in the United States, British TMC over here. That C sort of got dropped over time. And so they were going to be able to market the import and resell, or rather rent, the automatic machines. Um, there was a 25% royalty on sales, so there's an extraordinarily high royalty, and it's the thing that really holds um, BTM back. Uh, by contrast, actually, the, the, the royalty that Powers was paying, Powers Sands was paying, was 5% to Remington Rand, so it's a huge, a very onerous royalty rate. Um, so, in fact, the American company always made more than the British company ever did uh, from these machines. Um, well, as you know, uh, TMC was eventually, oh, sorry, let me, I'm skipping forward. Um, so, coming out of the First World War, things are looking quite good off. There's a sort of mini office machine boom in the UK, um, and uh, BTM gets, gets its first sort of, uh, special, <coughs> special built factory uh, in Letchworth. Um, that's a picture of it from 1948, which is obviously considerably bigger than the early factory. And on the, the right picture there shows um, the tabulators uh, being assembled. They were assembled from American manufacturing parts. Did you want to come in and sit down? You're okay. <laughs> yeah.
um, well, they were finding that the um, the royalty rate was was really too onerous, um, and it was inhibiting the company's growth. So they tried to get IBM to reduce the royalty rate, and uh, Everard Green went over and visited them. This was compounded by the fact that the um, sterling had been devalued uh, during this period by about 25%, so it was making the situation even worse. Um, but before um, they would speak, IBM sent in its auditors to see whether they'd actually been paying the royalty royalties on the stage, uh, which of course they hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> and IBM found that they were $20,000 uh, in arrears. Um, so uh, they really weren't going to negotiate until this had been straightened out. Um, well, Everard Green visited. Um, oh, this is an interesting picture. Um, this is the state of IBM. So we're talking about 1923, and, th and this is IBM. Um, you've, you usually see a photograph of, of uh, Thomas Watson Senior where he looks a very very old, wizened man. Actually, he was young once, and Charlie Philbox was young once. They were both kind of in their early 40s when this is happening. But on, if you look on the left, um, you can see at the bottom of that advert for what's become called IBM by now. Um, they've actually got five factories, and all of them are a lot bigger than what's going on in Lecture. So this is uh, Thomas Watson's principal beef against the British company. Um, they have a ter territorial split, so that it's Britain and the empire, and America and the rest of the world, which by market size is roughly a ratio of, of two to one. So that's what they felt the, the, the revenues of the companies ought to be. But if you look at the ratio of the revenues, it's more like 30 to one. So, by IBM standards, the, the British company is really underperforming. And the situation actually never really changes very much, as you can see, as you move forward into, even into the 80s. Um, at that point, um, Watson really wants to take over the company, and of course they don't want to be taken over. So he asks Everard Green if he would like to sort of buy some shares <coughs> as they become available, and he'll make it worth this while. Um, well, of course, he was a very sort of straight, honest Englishman, so when he got back, he was outraged by this sort of um, attempted bribery. Um, and, and this very interesting sort of correspondence up, uh, in the ICL files there. Well, everything goes quiet then. They, they set a deficit, get a new agreement. One of the things about the new agreement is that anything that they design and manufacture in England will not be subject to royalties. The most expensive piece of equipment is the tabulator, so I, ICL, sorry, BTM, then starts manufacturing its own thing called the rolling total tabulator, and that's its principal uh, development uh, between the wars. And then everything goes quiet, really, until Pearl Harbor um, in December 1941, uh, when there's a complete 180 degree turn, and IBM sort of becomes extremely friendly. Uh, it, it, gets a list of, of the names and addresses of all the employees and sends them all a food parcel. Um, and they pay, pay for a Christmas dinner so that suddenly the, the relationships have thawed. Um, 1947, hostilities resume. <laughs> um, by now, Raleigh Philpotts is Sir Raleigh Philpotts. Um, and uh, he's essentially retired. Um, it's the old story. IBM sends it, it orders its auditors again um, and finds that BTM is deficient to the tune of $350,000. Um, and one of the reasons being that uh, they have paid royalties net of tax, um, which would seem very reasonable to us, <laughs> but not, not, not to the Americans. Um, and uh, the Managing director by this time is Victor Stanners, who's the person sitting uh, in the middle. As you can see in that lovely picture, my favourite picture of them all, which is for, um, on the left, which is Rolly Philpotts and one of the other directors. Um, so uh, IBM really wants to sort of break the arrangement so that it, it can trade uh, on, on world, uh, it can trade across the world and, and not, um, not be excluded from, from uh, BTM's territories. 
and uh, it offers to let them off the 300,000 300, uh, deficit, um, but also they can carry on using all, all the punch card patents that, that they currently are using, uh, and they'll just part their ways, and IBM would be free to compete with BTM. Um, well, um, BTM leaps at the offer, because of course I'm, IBM is still making more money, out of money than BTM ever did, so it's more than double their profits. Um, it's a huge windfall, and they think that this uh, windfall of, they think, an extra £300,000 a year will be sufficient to fund the research in electronics that is clearly on the horizon. Well, I wrote in the book that this was the greatest mistake that BTM ever made, and I've not changed my opinion about that. Um, there were various things happening, I mean, in retrospect, Electronics computers were on the horizon, but computers were going to be enormously expensive to development. Um, but IBM was under intense antitrust pressure in the United States that wasn't resolved until 1956. So the idea of sort of splitting world markets with another firm was, was really would have been, I'm not sure the legality, but it wouldn't have been good in an antitrust court. Um, so uh, BTM was terribly badly advised, I suppose, by sort of parochial English lawyers. Um, and they could have got much, much better terms. But they broke, <coughs> broke the agreement on 14th of October, 1949. And uh, just over a week later, 25th of October, uh, IBM World Trade was formed. Uh, so I guess that getting rid of BTM was simply the last piece in the jigsaw puzzle there, of which uh, BTM is perhaps somewhat unaware. Well, um, moving swiftly on to talk a little bit about BTM and the secret war. Remember now, this is going back, I'm looking here, about 1985, and there's not very much written about, about the wartime code breaking. Um, there's a book called The Ultra Secret by F.W. Winterbottom. Um, there's Gordon Welchman's Hudson story, and Andrew Hodges had just completed his biography about maturing. So there was a certain amount in the public domain. Um, but when I looked inside the ICL archive, um, it just talks about sorry, it just talks about um, special purpose machines and machines for the government. There's never any word about what these machines were for. Um, so uh, I wanted to sort of speak to somebody uh, from ICL who had sort of worked there. And Gordon, um, the, the company secretary, uh, I think he did this through the pensions club and anyway, um, a man came called Norman Hedges who I interviewed in September 1985, this ICL company and the to talk. And he filled it with, with lots of really interesting detail which you'll find inside the book. These are the notes I made at the meeting, and it wasn't tape recorded, um, we, we just spoke. But I asked him, I've never actually seen a picture uh, of, of a BT, of a bomb, and um, I'm not quite sure whether one existed. The, the internet, there was no internet, so it was not easy to resolve that problem. We couldn't get every book on the library. But I'd never actually seen the picture. So I asked um, Norman if he could sort of sketch it for me. And that was that. This is from the notes uh, that I opened my notebook. This is what he drew um, and explained that there was a series of, of wheels, I don't know if you can see them, that across it, 12 rows of three wheel up. Well, two banks of 12 rows of, of three. Um, and he talked about the Uncle Walter, which has some un unpronounceable uh, German name. Uh, and I think it's the turnaround wheels or something. Um, and, uh, and there's stuff about the names and things like that. Um, we then had another go and drew a, a 3D orthogonal projection, um, which I then sent to. Uh, Oxford University Press who were doing the book and got them to sort of re redraw it for us by, by somebody who knew how to draw. Um, and this is what we came up with. I, I remember this rather vividly. We, I got the proof back and I was quite excited about it. I think this may actually be the first illustration of a bomb that ever was in print. Somebody may prove me wrong. Um, and I showed him what he said, ah, there's no wheels. <laughs> somebody remembered that the machine had wheels on. Um, so we sent it back and it goes on the floor. Um, but that's actually the uh, a photograph, I think that's a photograph of one, one of the actual bombs on the right. Uh, and actually it's a remarkably good uh, drawing. Um, well, I'm 
I'm going to move on to <coughs> talk about the, there's a lot more went on with BTN, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so um, I'll say a few words later if there's time. Um, but to talk a little bit about the transition to computers, <coughs> it's kind of famous quote, isn't it, that uh, Thomas Watson Sr. says the world will only ever need half a dozen computers. And, Hartree said much the same thing in this country, that we don't get any three. And in a way, that was right at the time, because um, they were talking about very large scientific computers um, that might be used by for atomic energy calculations or something. Um, but I'm here to talk with you that uh, electronics was the new horizon. And uh, they started to replace some of their slow mechanical machines with electronics to speed them up. The first thing they did was the 603 multiplier, and next the 604 calculated punch, which is shown in the adverts on the left, came out in 1948. Um, and that was a four function calculator. Um, but it would take data off punch cards and, and put the, the solutions actually punch on the card. They then uh, developed a system. <coughs> called the Card Program Calculator, which came out in 1949, which consisted of a 604 punch, um, a storage unit, and a tabulator, and a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, now, that was actually a, a pretty effective computing machine. Uh, and it, it often gets forgotten, but I, IBM sold 800 of those. And when you think how many computers had been sold by the early 50s, it was actually an enormously successful product that really was the workhorse of scientific computing for several years. Well, um, BTM really took their lead from uh, IBM and did exactly what they did a bit later. So they produced uh, an electronic multiplier which came out in 1952 uh, and they produced an electronic calculator which was similar to the IBM 604, same functionality. Uh, that was the 550, and it came out in 1956. There's a picture there of the 555, slightly superior model, being used at uh, uh, the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. <coughs> However, computers were obviously on the horizon. And um, the, the head of uh, development at BTM was, was Doc King, who had developed the, the bomb. Um, he was very hostile to uh, electronics. Um, Raymond Bird, uh, who eventually devised, uh, builds the heck machine, said, um, uh, he was told me, I said, I'm not going to put valves and valves in these machines. They'll drop out whenever a lorry passes. <laughs> um, so uh, to overcome this, they hire um, John Wamersley, who was the former head of, of the mathematics division at the National Physical Laboratory, where of course they built the pilot ace, and they want, want him to sort of look the same magic for them. Um, and John Wamersley, who's kind of a maverick character, there's no photographs of him, that's a sketch that some, somebody found, um, makes contact with Andrew Booth at Birkbeck College. Uh, and uh, he has a machine under development which he calls the, um, the AP, the Apex C, which stands for All Purpose Electronic X ray Computer. Uh, there's a story, and, and you may correct me, but it's a possibly apocryphal. The story is that um, he was actually under contract with the Brain Research Association, um, a Norwegian research association, and as well as BTM. So he, he, the story is that he had sort of a set of letters so that when, when Hollerith came along, the machine would be the APE and then H <laughs> would, would go in between the brackets. I mean, that was the, that was the design that uh, BTM decided to make. Um, actually, it was a very good decision because it didn't use a difficult memory technology. It used a drum uh, compared with delay lines or mercury lines and very difficult technologies at the time. Um, on the top left there, there's a, an original photograph of the prototype machine. And on the bottom left, um, there's Raymond the Bird in the background there, uh, 50 years on, 60 years on. Um, and that's the, uh, the machine which is now in the National Museum of Computing. Um, they developed that 
N2, look at the HEC2, which becomes a small scientific computer, eventually into the HEC4, which is shown on the right here, which is more of a data processing computer, and eventually it's marketed as the 1201 computer. It's actually very successful, the most successful of all the early British computers. It sells over 100, and I think, you know, things like the Pegasus sold, sold in the low 30s, so it really was very successful. Um, and then the next thing I found in the archives was that they're, they're sort of creating a computer strategy by 1957. And this is what they've decided to, to go. And it's all to go pear-shaped in a minute, but this is how it starts. Um, so they've got the, the, 12, the 1201, which is in production, and that's going to, it's a valve machine, and that's going to keep going for a bit. They need a transistorized machine, so they hook up with General Electric Company, and they manufacture the, what becomes the 1300 series. Um, and they also want a large machine, which is codenamed Atlanta in this particular diagram. Um, and that's being produced in association with the Laboratory for Electronics uh, in the United States. So they've, um, it, it's a research lab closely associated with MIT. Um, so that's the plan. Um, and you can see on the left the artist's impression of the 1301 that does actually reach the market. On the right is Atlanta, by this time, has been renamed Diana, as they've tried to reduce the cost. Where that name came from was that the technical director, Holly Martin, um, discovered that uh, LFE, the Laboratory of Electronics, was making a copy of this machine um, for the Chase Manhattan Bank. bank. So Diana was the goddess of the chase. <laughs> and the thing about that machine was that it was going to be real time, so at the bottom there is the, the drum that they were planning to use for it, the random access store. Um, but uh, um, what happens, of course, is that valves are going out, so they decide to abandon the, the Diana computer. And uh, the story is, I was told, that it got sold to Birkbeck College. I don't know if that is true. Yeah. Um, and it's in 1959, shortly after the period I'm talking, that uh, they decide that Power Samus and ETM decide to merge. <coughs> um, why did they merge? Well, there was a huge demand for tabulating equipment. So although the, the computer seemed like the future, actually 90% of the sales were of traditional punch card machines. Um, the market, there's still a lot of post-war pent-up demand, so they really wanted to sort of increase their manufacturing capability and to rationalize the product lines, and that was really the idea. Um, I interviewed uh, uh, Terence Maxwell, who was the person on the second left there, who was the chairman of the new company, who on the Sam's side. Um, he was a very nice man, actually, and um, he said that the decision of the two companies are absolutely unanimous, and that's what they should be doing. Um, and then there's a bombshell, and it's the IBM 1401. Um, and it's a complete game changer. Uh, it's announced in October 59 in the States, and it delivery starts within the early 60s, about 1960 in the UK. Um, and what makes it the game changer is a funny thing, really, that it's, it's actually the printer, the 1403 printer with it is 600 lines per minute, so it's, it's the equivalent of four tabulators, so that's suddenly the attraction. IBM is completely taken by surprise. Um, they're expected to sell 1,000 and sell over 10,000. One by 110. Um, the result is all the punch card equipment is rented, so people start you know, sending them back, so they have these huge... I had, and the same thing is going to happen, is happening at, at, um, at, BT, at ICT now. Um, the, uh, there was a story that there was such a flood of returns um, that they would stack them in the warehouse and eventually, if you've seen these machines, they're very big and robust that the ones at the bottom gradually got squashed <laughs> <laughs> on top. Um, so uh, Arthur Humphreys had now become head of marketing, so his job was really, they've got to kill off all of the valve machines, they're, they're just numbers, so he's got to find some, 
superior tr transistorized computers. And it goes over to the States. Um, there's actually a 30% decline in tabulator sales in a period of six months. So it's really, you know, the market is just changing. Um, so this is about 1961. He goes over to the States with his negotiating team and he talked to Burroughs and Univac and RCA, General Electric, Honeywell and CDC, and all those records are there in the archive. Um, in fact, there is talk with Burroughs that they would form a joint company. It's called Holo, Holrith Burroughs, actually. Yeah. Um, that sort of fades away. Univac have a machine called the 1004, which is sort of a transistorized pinch card machine, which they market over here as the ICT 1004. RCA has a machine called the 301 that becomes the ICT 1500. Um, uh, and they're also um, talking to Ferranti, who, which is trying to get out of the computer business at this stage. It's obviously a high stakes game, and Ferranti wants to get out of it. Um, and the attraction of them is that they have this machine, and it's in Ferranti Packard in Canada called the FP6000. Um, the machine apparently was originally called the Harry Act, because it was designed by Harry Johnson uh, and Ferranti uh, at, um, in my school. <coughs> anyway, they called it the Ferranti Packard 6000. The idea of, of a compatible range is in the air at this time, and the terminology in ICT, I see they call it the project set, is the phrase that they use. It's kind of an interesting historical fact. Um, so they go over to have a look at the FP6000 and decided, yes, this machine could become a set, and it would give them an 18 months lead from all the other alternatives that they've got. So they decide to go for that, and as a result, they merge with Ferranti uh, in September 1963. Um, and that's a picture of the people. So you've got um, Arthur Humphreys um, doesn't get to be managing director, which must have been a disappointment. They were never, never admitted. <coughs> um, Basil de Ferranti, who's the one with his um, chest and his chin on his, on his hand there, um, becomes the managing director. He's age 34, and he is the youngest son uh, of, of Vincent uh, de Ferranti, uh, who has a problem with two sons, Sebastian and um, Basil of Boz, as he's called. Um, so this is a nice way of resolving it. So S Sebastian get, gets the original for that for Auntie, and they get rid of Boz into <laughs> it. Uh, I see also there's no longer any conflict between them. It's a pretty controversial appointment, I must say, and uh, um, I'll, I'll say considerably less than, than, than it is in, in the, uh, some of the interviews I conducted. Um, but um, the general feeling was that he and they gave him a lot of support, but he really wasn't managing director material or he didn't have a uh, background for it. Um, for example, Peter Ellis told me, uh, who was the uh, director of manufacturing, that um, he ordered three numerically controlled machines at £500,000 a piece, which is serious money in that date, um, to manufacture lampions, and they were never really used. Um, uh, Terence Maxwell said, I thought he was a, a rich, sporty young man, uh, in his words. Um, I should say in his defense, uh, I've got to blacken his reputation, that um, I think I'd said a very muted version of that inside the book. But that was the one thing that Arthur Humphreys was a bit cross about in the book. He said, I, I didn't think you were very kind to battle, but actually, he, to be honest, he was about the only person uh, who made that comment. Anyway, um, the bombshells are coming thick and fast now because the next one is the IBM uh, 360 announced in April 1967, sorry, 1964. Um, and obviously, third generation computers are in the air, um, and they had to decide you know, what shall we do. So um, they go over to visit RCA at Cherry Hill uh, in the States. And, um, because, the, because they now have an arrangement with them, they can manufacture anything they produce under license. That was the thing that had been negotiated in 1961. Um, they looked to see what they're going to do. But it happens just as they're visiting, they're literally visiting when the 316 albums happens. <laughs> so um, to RCA, the people ask it, <laughs> go away for a week, come back, and we'll tell you what we're going to do. So they literally, that's literally what they do. 
and they come back a week later and say, well, we're going to make a system that becomes the Spectra 70, and it should be an IBM compatible computer. Generally in um, ICT, and Arthur Humphreys in particular, think that's a terrible strategy, because they're always going to be on the back foot. Um, they'll never have the, the volume of manufacturing that IBM has, and they'll always be kind of, kind of chasing, and also it's sort of against, <coughs> against their, um, uh, it, it goes against the, the grain that they're not invented here, I think. So, um, I'll hope it's the, and they decide that they will manufacture the 1900 series uh, and turn it into a project set into the series. Um, Arthur called it his $2 billion decision uh, because that, that was the eventual sales. Um, and that, that's the first machine. It actually does rather well, so it's announced in September 64, so it's really about six months later. Um, and uh, they can make deliveries in early 65, so almost immediately they've already built one. So we've got very early deliveries. At, uh, IBM is about two years later before they make the first deliveries of the System 360, so it's actually a very successful maneuver. Um, and uh, sort of morale soars. Um, but then <clears throat> there's a complete collapse. 1965 for the punch card machine markets. That's when it, when finally um, punch card machines really are going out and, and they're selling far more computers than there are punch card machines. And that brings on sort of one of the uh, ICT's mini crises. And it's really this um, uh, collapse of the punch card machine that is what precipitates this idea of the new range. So let me move on to that the next section. Um, there's quite a lot of technical histories of the new range, so um, I'm not going to be technical at all. I just want to talk about, I thought from the business history point of view, what is really interesting is how you cope with a very rapidly changing environment and how, you know, with the, the manufacturing um, setup. The first thing then was the, <coughs> the politics, which were extreme, um, courtesy of Wikipedia, and there's a, a chart here. So you have the, the, the Labour governments that were very pro-government intervention in industry. And then you have the Conservative governments that were 180 degree opposed to that, completely against any kind of intervention in, uh, intervention in industry. That's the political environment. The economic environment is also very difficult. Um, but you've got um, a, a fluctuating uh, dollar sterling exchange rate. IBM, sorry, ICT, 60% uh, of its exports, 60% of its sales are exports. So you can imagine the, the sterling fluctuates between 1.1 and uh, $2.4. So it's a huge, you know, it's huge swings. Um, and you know, how does a company cope with that? Um, Notice this uh, gap here, um, if I could just, this point here actually is 1967, and it's the de devaluation of the pound under the Wilson government. Um, and then after that, um, the uh, fixed exchange rates are abolished, and then it really goes, goes crazy, doesn't it? Um, <clears throat> this isn't just Britain um, that's, that's concerned about the computer industry. Uh, in Paris, you, you've got the um, Plan calcul, we have something similar in Germany where governments are intervening with industry. So Britain is not particularly uh, out of the line. Um, <coughs> you remember the, the Wilson um, coming into power in October 1964, and that famous that building a new Britain forged in the white heat of the scientific revolution, very familiar to people of age. Um, and, uh, he says in his memoirs um, <coughs> that when he formed, when they penned him into government, they formed the Ministry of Technology, and he had in his opinion, he had been told about a month to save the UK computer industry. <laughs> so um, the government really is a very sort of anxious to, to do things. Um, Anthony went with Ben, his delightful photo on the right, um, with Miss Honeywell, the robot. <laughs> <laughs> becomes the, the new Minister of Technology. Um, and people that I spoke to said, 
he was like a boy scout. I mean, he's, he's, he's not he's not the um, the Wedgwood Ben <laughs> than he was in his later years, but very very interventionist and enthusiast for technology. Um, and the when I was in the archive, um, the ICL archive, there were several MOX files that had the word Tehran, you know, as in as in as in Iran written on it. I thought something to do with Middle Eastern sales. Um, when eventually I looked inside, Tehran as actually was, was the code word for the merger between ICT and Munich Electric. <laughs> <laughs> so inside were all the all the all the documents is a real real treasure trove. Um, <clears throat> And uh, Reginald Bedroom takes kind of hands on this, it's not just the apparatchiks. Um, offers ICL uh, a £25 million pound grant uh, to help them develop a, a new range. Um, the, they then have this, um, what's called the two range <laughs> dilemma. Um, are they going to be able to create a new range if, in, English Electric and ICT merge their computer interests. Are they going to be able to make a new range that will also have um, an exit path for the current ranges? And that's the thing that they're dealing with. So um, several people, uh, six people, including John Pinkerton on the technical side and George Felton, are sort of sent to the Hotel Cavendish uh, in London. Uh, and they spend two or three days there. Um, and they come back with this report saying, yes, we think using emulation techniques and various technologies, they will bring it to, to do this. Um, so the merger is agreed. Um, and then <coughs> there are three bombshells. The first is that Plessy decides to make a takeover bid, uh, which comes in August 1967, because they see a convergence on computers and communications, and they really want to have the whole thing. Um, EMI then comes in fortnight later and says, no, we want it as well. So they make a takeover bid for, I, for ICT and English Electric. Um, the third bombshell is that Sterling is devalued from $2.8 to $2.40, 15% devaluation. And um, the government says, oh, well, that $25 million is now going to be $13.5 million. Uh, but the whole thing has gone past the point of no return. I mean, there was such an expectation that the merger would take place. And how it's resolved is that um, Plessy gets an 18% shareholding in the final company, puts some money in. John Wall on the extreme left there, who's the EMI chair, um, managing director, becomes the chairman of, of ICT, so everybody's sort of left, left happy. And Arthur Humphreys at last becomes managing director. Um, uh, here's an interesting thing I couldn't say in the book. Um, his salary was 12,000 a year. Um, and I suppose that the average salary of an ICT employee at that time would have been the order of 1,000. So the multiple was the order of 10, 12. Um, I see in the Financial Times this week it's 145. <laughs> 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 um, but I interviewed him in his home and he had a very comfortable lifestyle, not noticeably rich in my own lifestyle. He had a comfortable life and seemed very contented. Um, so the new range planning gets, gets started, um, and they select their various options. Eventually, no surprise really, the electrosynthetic option, which won't be anything like, like the existing ones, but you know, completely new sheets of paper. And the new range planning organization is organized under Mike Forrest. It was interesting because I interviewed him, he was extremely amiable, um, but he had a terrifying reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then the next um, thing that happens is that there's a, the idea that the computer industry goes into its first worldwide recession. Some of you may be old enough to remember it. I remember it quite vividly. Um, and uh, <coughs> it's, it's so bad that RCA exits from the computer industry altogether. General Electric also exits, and there's lots of some minor firms that drop out of the industry. Um, ICL has a big drop in sales um, and it lays off, uh, has to lay off 1,600 people, which is almost the first time they've done anything like that. Um, and they only just avoid a loss. Unfortunately, there's been a change of government now and uh, 
Ted Heath is in power, and uh, it's now the lame duck policy, so they're not going to touch industry, sink or swim um, by yourself. Um, what saves um, IC, ICR as it has then become uh, is that uh, Rolls Royce nearly goes bankrupt. So, some of you remember Rolls Royce in 1970, where they reformed the company because it's such a strategic company. Um, and that kind of, kind of loosens the thing. So, ICL goes in and says they really need £35 million pounds for, to maintain research and development on the new range of computers. Uh, and um, they killed off the Ministry of Technology, you know, they killed off the industrial organisation. So, it falls to the DTI, as it's then become, um, to agree a loan of what venture goes 50 million if they have new management. So, they can have a <coughs> so this is the new, the new management. Um, the problem that's actually facing RCL at the moment um, is, is that if you look at the size of the company, and it, it's this RD, it's spending actually nearly 12% of its income is going on research and development compared with IBM spending about half as much. So it really needs to get, get big. Um, and uh, the government sort of accepts that argument. So if they give them 50 million, it will kind of close that gap compared to other manufacturers. Uh, but the new management, um, well, Tom Hudson comes in from Plessy, who was the chairman, uh, deputy chairman of Plessy at that time. Uh, but he was the, found, the founder of IBM UK going back in the 1950s, so he has a very good pedigree. Um, and the other person who comes in is Jeff Cross. Um, <laughs> Arthur told me that they met him in Pennsylvania Station. To, it was found by headhunter, and they met him over on the lunch at Pennsylvania Station and sealed the deal uh, one weekend. Uh, and Jeff Cross comes in. He's age 47. And Arthur gets pushed upstairs and becomes deputy chairman. Uh, um, Cross has a fantastic reputation as a financial management, and there are legion stories of how he would sort of get in somebody's financial forecast and land on the wrong figure, but it was suspicious. Um, I found he's a very good financial manager. I interviewed him in New York, by which time he'd left ICL. Um, and uh, he invited me to say, well, we invited me to a quite a fancy restaurant for lunch. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> he left me to pay the bill. <laughs> so, it still grieves me, I remember he had a very small salad that cost $37, which was about what I was paying for a hotel room. Anyway, um, he's very successful actually, and uh, he becomes young business of, businessman of the year in 1976. I see I was made a really good recovery. Um, and he leaves at that time, uh, and Chris Wilson, uh, in the next picture, takes over uh, as managing director. ICL by now has launched the 2900 series uh, in October 1974. Um, and there was a lot of rumours that uh, Cross had left while the going was good. <laughs> and in a way, I, I sort of think that's half true, um, because that 50 million and government subvention had just finished in 1976. It actually finishes. So Chris Wilson then is left with this job of having to increase sales so that they could afford to continue to maintain the R&D as, a, as a, an acceptable proportion of turnover. Um, <clears throat> well, the next bombshell, of course, is another financial crisis in 1980. The government, the Thatcher government, was elected in 1979. There's another computer recession. They maintain the lame duck policy um, and uh, of non-interventionists, particularly under Keith Joseph. Um, sterling peaks then at dollars at 240, so it's almost doubled the value of sterling. Uh, and um, of course, it causes a, an enormous sort of crisis in the firm. Um, and they're advised by the government that they should sell the firm for a penny. <laughs> uh, a bit like resting in British home stores, we'd call them. Um, and um, <clears throat> eventually, what saves ICL actually is the fact that next year, it's 1982, it's going to be IT82. Um, and, 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 uh, 
and having uh, information technology uh, having a national champion beautiful <laughs> go down the tubes um, that would be a good idea so that's Ken, Ken Baker who was very very supportive of the firm uh, in the middle of that picture there um, and the government agrees to 100 200 million pound loans so it's big money provided they change their management <laughs> <laughs> So they changed the handling. Um, I interviewed um, Chris Wilson uh, because, of course, he's, um, uh, he seemed to have failed. He was, he was sort of rueful about the whole thing, actually. Um, some people I interviewed were quite angry, but he wasn't. Um, he, was, he was quite mild. Um, he said, actually, he said he was having a prostectomy when this happened. Uh, he was about to have a prostectomy, so it just seemed like a very good moment <laughs> to leave anyway. Um, and uh, the people they appointed were um, uh, Christopher Laidlaw was appointed as chairman. He was deputy chairman of BP so, and, a, and, a, and a director of Barclays Bank, so a really, really big figure. Um, and Rob Wilmot and Peter Bonfield. Um, Laidlaw was, uh, Christopher Laidlaw was an um, extremely influential figure, um, incredibly sort of amiable. Um, he invited me to lunch at the Garrick Club, of all places. He was very well placed. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he described the negotiations with, with Rob, Rob Wilmot. Um, he said he'd take, taken, um, they'd taken, he was managing director of of Texas Instruments in the UK, um, and was thought to be leaving with cash. And the people I spoke to in government were absolutely convinced that was the case. Um, so uh, he met him in his house in Chester, Chester, in Laidlaw's house in Chester Street, which is a pretty good address. Um, and they had it over, over terms, uh, which it really involved, um, well, I'm guessing, an extraordinary number of share options and a very high salary. Um, the, co the comment that Laidlaw made to me, and these are his words, not mine, he was a greedy little bugger. <laughs> uh, in fact, um, Wilmot had a heck of a reputation for sort of arrogance uh, in, inside the firm. Um, and he sort of remade uh, ICL, um, not least by a huge redundancy program. If you just look at the number of personnel on the right there, it basically goes down from about 33,000 when he takes over down to about 20,000. It's like 40% of the standard pie. It's a terrible time in ICL. And he didn't have too many friends there, you can perhaps imagine. Um, it was said that he would never meet people one to one, but was apparently very good at addressing a group. Um, it was the only person actually who declined to be interviewed of, of all the people, and as I asked. By contrast, Peter Bonfield was extremely approachable and had um, quite a different personality. Anyway, um, Wilmot had just had a master stroke, and that is to get in with Fujitsu to use their semiconductor technology, and that enables ICL to get out of chip manufacture altogether uh, using very, very um, state of the art componentry. And the picture there that they use quite a lot shows the Series 39, which is series becomes and just showing you how much smaller the machines have become less energy intensive, etc. etc. <clears throat> well, I'm running to the end. Um, so I just want to finish by talking about whether ICL could actually have survived. As you know, um, four months after my book came out, um, it, it was taken over by Fujitsu, and I had absolutely no idea that was going to happen. It was a complete surprise to me. Um, but just to complete the story then, uh, Laidlaw retired in 1984 at the age of 65 and Michael Edwards took over, who had been involved with British Leyland. Um, and, but four months after that, um, STC made a takeover bid for ICL, um, which again was, was wanted. Um, ICL was doing very well, its share price was very high. Um, and so all the shareholders were happy, and STC wanted this convergence of communications computers, so it kind of touched China with what was the in industry thought at the time. Um, Wilmot resigned, and Edwards resigned. I, I asked um, 
then go away where he thought Wilmot resigned. He said, I probably couldn't get enough, enough share options. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, at this stage, um, it's February 1989, <coughs> and i am uh, just completed the manuscript and I'm about to ship it off to Oxford University Press. And the last interview I'm going to conduct is with uh, Peter Bonfield. Actually, he's having an interview with me, really. Um, <clears throat> and in the final chapter, I refer to ICL's sort of um, past and future, and you know, what, what the future was told for ICL. And I think I, I, I no longer have that manuscript. Um, but I think I said um, to the effect that, well, look, ICL and its forebears had a financial crisis about every 15 years, and an existential crisis every 15 years, and sort of a mini crisis about every five. So it's not, they're not going to um, ride into the sunset you know, to, a, to a, a certain future. Um, Peter Bonfield, uh, who was a very likable person, said, <laughs> You may, you may get read as though I see it as a death wish. <laughs> um, so again, that was his words. Um, so, uh, of course, I realized it was awkward because the ICL had the right not to publish if they didn't wish to. So he said, I'd, I'd like actually to drop this final section, which if you read it, it does end slightly abruptly. Um, so I said, yes, that's okay. Well, it ends in an anodyne manner. Um, so I said, yes, that's fine. He said, well, if you do that, I won't look at the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was an outstanding piece of negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> that's why he served to Bonfield. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, I, I did think that ICL would survive um, because most, you know, the, a lesson of business history is that most 100-year-old companies do survive. Um, but uh, so, and purely in retrospect, um, if you look now, what might have happened? Well, Burroughs and Univac have merged. You know, what, do you remember it was IBM and the bunch uh, after the exit of General Electric and uh, MCA? Um, so Burroughs and Univac have merged to form Unisys and they're still in business. NCR is acquired by AT&T in a very similar way that ICT, ICL was acquired by SDC communications connection, and it sort of, kind of, sort of vanishes from the sight of it. Control Data Corporation is just broken up and all the different pieces sort of scattered to the wind. Honeywell comes out of computing in 1991, um, and ICL, of course, has the largest corporate loss in history in 1991. Sorry. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I did make the largest corporate cost in history in 1993, and it had an existential crisis from which it recovered. Um, so uh, I think, you know, given how everybody else fared, it's, it's hard to imagine that ICL would have necessarily survived. Um, looking back, I would say what we should have done was go in with Burroughs and Univac, actually. Um, as a tripartite company, that probably would have worked quite well. They, they actually have very similar cultures. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's Fujitsu ICL now, and I think it's just, is it just Fujitsu? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, something on a good note. Martin, thank you for that. Uh, question time. There's a uh, if you could wait for the microphone, uh, Kevin, I think there's a, there's a hand right at the back. Uh, I saw go up. Of course. Right. Is that working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can't see Hal Brian. Uh, Martin, you said there was a technical archive created at Letchworth. What happened to it? Yeah, um, it was broken up. And half of it went to the Science Museum, uh, that's being catalogued now, by uh, Hamish Carmichael. And uh, the other half went to the National, the National Archive of the History of Computing at Manchester University, where it still is, and can be seen, so it stayed in town. I think the uh, next line on your uh, side there, Martin, should be something about Microsoft Windows. 
<laughs> came in and that, I think, changed the face of computing completely. Yes, it, it, that's right, obviously. Um, it, it's, it's a complicated story of, of how kind of personal computing in, interacted with, with mainframes. Um, they sort of didn't see it coming until it was a little bit too late in the way. Um, I remember talking to people in ICL, um, you know, what, what were they doing about microprocessors? Well, of course, there was the one per desk, you know, sort of and we said, mm -hmm. oh, well, we use them, we use them in the mainframes. And I thought, yeah, you know, that they hadn't, I thought they hadn't quite, quite got the message. That's in the early 80s, actually. I saw an angle, I noticed your comment <laughs> on the rapid departure of Jeff Cross. Yes. I was a sector controller at the time, yes. and we were told that the Inland Revenue had just discovered his payment contract, <laughs> and he had three months to leave the country or be made bankrupt. <laughs> and to comment whether he came across anything, anything that might substantiate that. Isn't that problem. interesting? Yeah, well, the, the story I heard was that he had a child with um, <laughs> a, a pulmonary condition, and they wanted to get to her. Certainly, uh, when I spoke to Jeff Cross, he, he, he didn't recognise that description of, of having guess, guessing out while the going was good. Um, uh, but it's interesting, yeah. yeah. I, no, no, no. I heard that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was told by Richard Dean, who's made in this audience, will have known, that in the late 50s and early 60s, the Cadbury... Sorry, we can't hear that. Yeah, can we talk to a bit closer? The Cadbury's chocolate company, formed in Birmingham, had three warehouses. One was full of cocoa beans, one was full of chocolate bars, and one was full of punch cards. <laughs> and I think it is often forgot that the provider suppliers of punch cards in the tabulator type industries were BTM and IBM. There were other suppliers, but they supplied mostly. And the revenues that that brought in were yes. very substantial yeah. indeed. And the introduction of computers, which of course didn't use punch cards <laughs> as a consumer in the same way, would be a very substantial factor in that dive in profitability uh, in around 1965, that you showed. That's absolutely right. Um, there used to be, um, there was an article in the 1930s um, about, in Fortune magazine about IBM, and they used to, they said that. Uh, it's, it's in the rent and refill business. It's a bit like Gillette razors. Um, you, get, you get the razor for very little, and then you pay for the razor for later. And the punch cards was the same thing. In ICL's case, 30% um, of its revenues, and this is going to the 30s and 40s, 30% of its revenues was generated by the same punch cards, which were sold in many multiples of the, of the cost of Thank you. Thank you for the rerun of the book. <laughs> I've got a signed copy from the original publication. <laughs> um, mentioning the Jeff Cross and Tom Hudson era, one of the things that is worth noting is one of the deals they did was to acquire Singer Business Machines, which, which actually got us out of a few holes, yeah. revenue-wise, and uh, established us quite strongly, or more strongly, in the retail marketplaces. And it also introduced some products for, that were in development and got us closer into the micro and mini, uh, sorry, micro processor type technology in the early days of, but uh, it led into, like you say, one of the desk and uh, also particularly the DRS range of products that we acquired through Utica. So uh, I think that was an important uh, piece of activity. It, it absolutely was. Um, I, I was just constrained by the amount of time I had today to talk about that. Um, but yeah, it was a, um, the the new range um, was generating thirty. At this time, you're talking about the Jeff Cross era. The new range is generating thirty percent uh, of, of the bottom line of the, of the revenue stream but it's consuming 60% of the r d costs. So get, being able to get this, I mean, it came from the Singer business machines that they, it was an incredibly successful turnover, basically because they had developed products 
and so there was really no, no big sort of R&D commitment to keep them going. Um, and then the ME29 was another extremely successful machine, um, which again made a huge difference to the, uh, to the profitability of the company. In, in a way, um, the new range was sort of an, an albatross on the firm in a way. It was, um, it was a lovely thing to do, you know, a magnificent objective, but actually to, to make it financially viable was, was a thing that really held an ICL back on those years. But then it wouldn't have been the same company if it was just reset, you know, re-badging machines and people. So, I'd like to mention, I don't think you haven't uh, had any particular mention of more of the media and the services side, so <coughs> data set and data scale. Yeah, and then I do in the book. I'll do. I'll yeah, do. yeah. Um, again, it's just, just the constraint of, uh, of this talk. Um, round about, uh, it's really when the, when the software industry is starting to take off, kind of late 60s, early 70s, and I don't mean packaged software, I mean you know, software and services type of industry. Um, I think, if I remember rightly, uh, it starts off with Barrick, which is Barclays and International, or something like that, um, as a computer services <coughs> firm, and then it becomes data skill when they start doing these bespoke software. And it makes a, a pretty significant contribution to the overall firm. And of course, that's what, what IBM ends up doing in the 1990s, actually. And it is today, where really. it's all computer services and very little, uh, relatively little manufacturing. Uh, Sorry, I saw a hand just on the Some observations about one or two of the characters we've been talking about. I had the uh, privilege to work in ICL East Africa in the early 70s. And one of the things about Nairobi was that all flights to South Africa used to have to stop there. And we used to get the close a lot of South Africa was ICL's most important mm -hmm. revenue earning overseas territory, so all the managing directors and other notables would come through Nairobi. And they'd wish to be, of course, entertained and looked after, and they're usually there with their wives. <laughs> so I got the opportunity to meet many of them socially and to entertain them. Uh, what I was going to say about Jeff Cross was he has an extremely hard head for alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember consuming with him and Bonnie and, and Keith Rogers, the managing director at the time of I said this after four bottles of, of, of Hennessy brandy in the new Stanley Grill, uh, and I had to pay for it too. <laughs> <laughs> He was in the habit of uh, doing a toast and now ending the glass and then another one. <laughs> yes, can you follow? Yeah. yeah, well there's something to be following up for four. I've got a stack going, don't we? It's switched on, just hold it close to your mouth. Don't worry. Uh, I don't have to press anything, do I? No, no, no that's good. <laughs> I uh, once had the privilege to um, uh, give a presentation to the to the board, Rob Wilmox and Peter Bonfield. Uh, I went over the heads of all my bosses, so I wasn't very, really, very popular about uh, getting this organised. Uh, but the gist of what I tried to say to them, uh, or what I did say to them, was we aren't in the hardware business. And uh, unless this all went we are in the software business. That is how we differentiate our products from everybody else. And the hardware only costs us money, and, uh, and we're losing it. Um, and uh, you may be amused to know that I am still running Jaguars on my VME profits. Thank <laughs> 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 you. A little thing about I thought of Frenzy at the time of the merger. Um, I was working with um, English computers on a certain department, and basically the axes started falling all over the place on some of the interesting research projects. And Basil asked me to give a presentation at board level 
on my project. Would you believe that two of the directors gave apologies? The others didn't even turn up. <laughs> As a result, my project was axed without any proper assessment whatsoever. <laughs> um, I don't know how far the Plessy involvement, because in your book you mentioned them were very tight on this, and may have affected the way that the act was being wielded. Yes, I, I don't know. What, what date, can you recall what date that was? This would be 16, in the 68, 69. Um, I can't remember. I could, I could tell from my records at home, you know, yeah. but basically, um, Kavanaugh and Pinkerton supported my work, convinced Kavanaugh it was worth doing, and unfortunately, it's involved hard by that, partly because of patents. You couldn't patent software. My thing, what it could have been done in software, it could also be done in hardware. And I think it got chopped. Because patents were involved and involved hardware. And it went the same way as the basic language machine of Stevenage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's my final question right in the back corner? Oh, I've got two. I've got two. I've got two questions. Just, just an aside, really. Do you remember? The, the time that, that the gentleman down the front was in the um, uh, Prudential Insurance Company. Yeah, does it ring a bell? I think someone that was down at the Prudential Insurance Company. Imagine my surprise when the, this was my territory around here as an outside engineer. This was my standing ground. Um, and um, that, that we were told in the factory all power salmon's routines are black except the ones that go over here are going to be power grabby. And when I got in the potential, everything's green. The whole damn lot's green. Four on one spot. I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. Amazing. I suppose Prudential didn't insist on it. No? <laughs> Interesting that side. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> in, in the early days, in my early days in computing uh, in the 60s, um, I seem to remember that. Uh, if you ask what was the difference between um, ICL and IBM, you were told ICL made computers and IBM made money. This is a tiny little bit of gossip. As an undergraduate intern looking for a job in uh, computing, uh, I went to, uh, uh, I was at, at an interview with um, ICL and then we, our some of the graduates were sort of given a little bit of um, refreshment. And I remember Basil DeFrant standing there, and the thing that I noticed, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, was that his collar was uh, torn. <laughs> his, his shirt collar uh, looked as though it needed to be replaced. I seem to recall that um, there were a number of other um, British computer companies, uh, English Electric, Leo and Marconi, all sort of bunched together. I can't in, in, Sort of at the back of my mind, I, I, I had a feeling that they also got in, incorporated into ICL. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Parts of the yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. process control machines from that is, I think, the yeah. 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 There's really the merging of these sort of data processing yeah. sections yeah. in the industry. Okay, um, <laughs> last one, I think. Do you know the and the demise of uh, Rob Wilmot. I know that Jeff Cross has died, and uh, I've just published the fact that uh, I found that Ed Mack died a couple of years ago. What's happened to uh, Mr. Wilmot? I'm not sure. Um, when I checked him out some time back, he was, um, I think he had a, a consulting firm called Oasis or something like that. So I imagine he was still sort of a technical consulting firm at some time. He's about the same age as me, so he didn't, um, it's not old. <laughs> uh, Martin, I think on that note, <laughs> from one young
youngster to another, <laughs> can, I, can I thank you on behalf of everybody here uh, for giving us a, a very interesting uh, tour uh, through uh, uh, the history of ICL uh, and uh, I think the uh, questions uh, indicate uh, the, the interest of people uh, in that subject. So first of all, thank you very much for that.